Thanks, Bert. And I have to say, um, thank you to the Smarter Cape Summit for inviting me here. I do appreciate the opportunity. And my operations manager just texted me and asked if I could take a picture. And I said, let me just take it from the lectern. Um, the other thing is I'm setting this up is you've heard about how speakers are afraid and they just are told to uh, picture the audience in their underwear. I downloaded an app this morning. That's good. I wanted to get you laughing. It's a good icebreaker. It's a little creepy, though. You can check our website tomorrow, mygenerationenergy.com, and uh, see if it really turned out the way it was supposed to. Let me move quickly here, because I know you're all here just because the senator is speaking next, and so this is just sort of the warm-up band. Let's get this over with. Um, but I am uh, proud to say that um, it was exactly two years ago, minus three days, when uh, I was here before this group. It was at the Wequasset at the time. And um, I introduced, among other things, the idea of a community solar garden. So now it's two years later. Part of today's uh, presentation, let me just back up to the title slide again. Part of the presentation is to do an update on that project. Uh, there are three topics to this. They will go quick. Um, first is the regional impact. How has solar energy impacted Cape Cod? And lastly is some of the challenges involved in solar energy going forward. So first, just a little background. Solar is very dependent on what is called net metering. In 2008, the laws changed that allowed this process to uh, proliferate across this state. So first of all, um, I want to give a shout out to NSTAR, my friends there that help us every day. I do have them to thank for several things. I've got another list for them, too. Uh, but when solar is installed on a business or home, now you've got two electric meters. One comes from your roof and one comes from the street. And on a moderately sunny day, or a cloudy day even, you get some of your energy from your roof, but the rest still comes from the street. On a nice bright day like today, many of our homes are actually self-sufficient on solar or actually producing enough electricity to push some of that back to the grid. In a sense, we're providing our neighbors with solar electricity at that time. The beauty of this net metering regulation is there's no reason to store the electricity. People are always using whatever you can make. So you make as much as you can all the time. You use whatever you need, whenever you need it, and you can transfer any excess to someone else's NSTAR account. Now, on a residential scale, let me run down the ben benefits very quickly. Uh, on a personal level, there are financial benefits. On a kind of broader scale, there are environmental and educational benefits to this technology. Now, on really a strategic and um, infrastructure scale, distributed generation, which is what this is called, puts energy into the grid where it's needed, when it's needed. When do we use the most electricity? On a day like today, in the middle of the day. And that's when solar is producing it. And it's producing it at places where people are using it. Now, one of the trends that's been interesting is it's crossing more demographics. More people are engaging in solar. It's not just for the crazy green people anymore, off-grid. It's for everybody. We have uh, meters that we install in Republicans' houses and ones that we install. <laughs> we'll sell to anyone. <laughs> That's right. Um, it's been amazing, the amount of growth just in the past three years, essentially since that law of 2008 was enacted in regulations. Um, Let's take a quick, quick peek at a commercial scale project. This one happens to be in Mashpee, and it's got the best uh, helicopter view, and that's why you're seeing it today. It powers the equivalent of about 40 homes. And in this case, that project is on top of a building that has humidity and temperature control. So they use a lot of power. Now, the tragedy is, in a sense, if we didn't have so much stuff, then we wouldn't need to generate that power. But that's another story. Um, what's really fascinating about today's technology, though, too, is you have online monitoring capability. You can monitor all the systems from your cell phone remotely. Each user, each owner can see what's going on every day, every 15 minutes. And uh, finally, I want us to linger on this picture. This is uh, about two miles down the road on the other side of the airport. Uh, currently, this and the Cape Cod Commission is nodding. Yes, this, this did go through the commission. Um, this system's been online for about six months, and it's produced enough energy on average year-round 
for about 240 homes. Now, as you linger on the picture, the next slide I'm going to show you is going to be a bit controversial. I took the data that is available at the state level, it's an Excel file from the Department of Energy Resources, and it breaks it down by town, the number of installations, and the total power. I did the towns on the Cape. I looked at that. I divided it per capita. Now, of course, you know, there's data, and then there's the way you interpret and present data. So, you know, if you're from Truro, anybody from Truro? Yep. Uh, Yarmouth? Okay, yep. Some of you are going to be happy. Some of you, not so much. So let's look at this graph. Um, the bright orange indicates the number of watts per person installed. So, uh, for example, in Barnstable, where we are now, everyone gets uh, effectively a 75-watt light bulb powered by solar. See what I mean? 75 watts per person. Now, if you look on the other scale, the green bars, it's the number of installations for every 1,000 people. So in a town like Truro, there's almost eight installations for every 1,000 year-round residents. So almost 1%, if you look at it that as a penetration ratio. Now, is it fair to do it this way? Because you say, well, look, Turo has year-round residents of 2,000, but homes that support many more part-time residents. So you can look at the data different ways. But the trends are interesting. You look at the Outer Cape trend. A lot of installations per person. And in the case of East Ham, one really big installation that bumps the power per person up, the orange bar. Uh, you look at my hometown of Brewster, it's a nice, well-balanced, medium, middle-of-the-road kind of uh, arrangement. We've got some big projects, we've got a lot of people with, with them on their homes. Now, we can sit and stare at this for hours and talk about it. It's like modern art. Nobody knows exactly what to say, but you can all kind of stare at it for a while. <laughs> I hope I didn't offend too many people yet. I'm still working on it. All right, let's pause on that for a second. That's the impact on Cape Cod so far. And these data start at 2010, so there's a few that aren't included here, but for the most part, that represents the profile. Now let's move on to this concept of a community solar garden. Now, figuratively speaking, it's a lot like a community vegetable garden. It's a common area where many people gain benefit from the product. And people ask, well, so how does that community solar garden actually power my house? What you have to do is kind of picture a reservoir. And the grid in this analogy is the reservoir. People that live around the reservoir might take a cup of water out of it and drink it. And a big truck backs up to the reservoir at the other end and dumps the truck load in. And so as long as the people dipping the cups out contribute to the truck, it doesn't really matter if it's that water or some other water that they're drinking. So we took that approach. And in terms of electricity distribution, let's look at how that works for the wonderful town of Brewster. Who's here from Brewster? Bert. Oh, yes, and Bert, of course. So in the town of Brewster, the site is located next to the water department. It is on town land. It's leased from the town. And if you're a golfer, it's right across from the driving range across from Captain's Course. This is satellite view. There are 1,440 solar panels in the um, what used to be essentially a, an unofficial dump. So the project is located in this corner of town, and we formed a nonprofit cooperative of residents and businesses within Brewster who became members of the cooperative and owners of what are called sun shares. We've got about 30 residents. And we've got the Brewster Baptist Church as a member and Millstone Liquor Store. Beautiful cross-section. <laughs> so those members were formed uh, as the system was being built. Their membership dues pay into the owner of the system, which is a for-profit entity set up specifically to own the system. And in this system, just like net metering on a home, there are two meters, the NSTAR meter that's yellow and then the green meter that measures the solar electricity. The members of the cooperative take all of the credits that the NSTAR meter uh, arranges. And last month, there were $7,000 worth of credit. And that is split 50 ways for the cooperative members. Now, the Brewster Baptist Church has five of those ways, so they actually get how many percent? Math and science? Five, uh, 10. 
10%. Bob, where are you? <laughs> and this project has been going on for a year now. But let me focus on a couple aspects of this particular project um, that I think are pretty amazing. One is we revegetated the site. Uh, we didn't do so to make it look like the nice green lawn behind me in the, in the photograph here, or the painting. It's revegetated to be in more of a natural state. And in fact, um, we also experimented with a concept where we maintain the stormwater on the site. So in effect, underneath the panels are just a continuous rain garden. This, was, this photo was taken right after our big rainstorm last uh, September, where it rained about three inches in a half an hour. Now, going back to the energy, though, in the first year, it produced 464,000 kilowatt hours. What does that mean? It means that it was enough energy to power those 50 homes that year. It was above projections, and here for you data freaks, here's how the money came out. $60,000 worth of net metering credits were delivered to the co-op and distributed to their members. We were right on target, and uh, so far, we're ahead of schedule in its second year now. So. Since two years ago, when this was still a concept, it has now been proven. It's been online for over a year. The members of the co-op have had two annual meetings. Everything seems to be going well, probably better than I would have expected two years ago, honestly. Um, the town of Brewster has made out. They've gotten a lease for a piece of land that wasn't producing any revenue previously, and they've been paid property tax. Let me go aside here for a second. The town of Brewster was very cooperative with us, supportive, worked with us, and that includes the tax assessor's department. You won't hear me compliment NSTAR very often or the tax assessor, but in this case, both were deserving of compliments. Um, I should also point out that um, this caused other local businesses to prosper, at least to some degree. There were engineers involved locally. Um, as you can see, the insurance agent is about a half a mile down the road, and the bank is another three quarters of a mile. And I think at least one of them is sponsored, so it's okay to put their logo on here. <laughs> uh, here's a great picture right after one of our big storms in the winter, and a uh, beautiful blue sky day like today right after that storm. The system was back just buzzing away. Uh, by the way, it doesn't make any noise. Uh, fortunately, it was one of those storms where the wind was very high, and so all the snow was blown right off the panels as it came down. It was all set to go the next day. So now, let's uh, just focus on the last topic, and that is what are the challenges? And I know people like these top 10 lists, top five lists. It's a short presentation, so we'll keep it at five. Common misperception. The payback is too long. Frankly, it's only four to six years. The warranty on the panels is 25 years. It makes sense. Uh, the other misperception is, uh, you want to talk to my neighbor. He's the crazy one that wants to live off grid. It's for everybody now. And uh, another one that's uh, an interesting argument is, isn't the technology changing so fast that it's not worth investing in what they're making today? Now, you feel that way about computers and cell phones and all that. But the fact is, solar panels, even though they're technology-based, can't get that much more efficient. And the sun's not going to get that much brighter. So when you make an investment today and it pays off in four or five years, you're making free electricity from there on. And it doesn't matter whether it would work a little bit better or not. You're not putting any money into the fuel that's going into those panels, unlike a boiler or a furnace. Another common mis uh, well, problem and obstacle, I think, long term is where we're going to be getting our equipment. Five years ago, it was in global supply. Today, over 80% of the panels produced in the world come out of China. Uh, we've fought tooth and nail to keep US materials. Uh, what you see down the road is all made in Tennessee. That factory is now being closed. Uh, we're forced now to go to LG and Hyundai in Korea. At least they're in South Korea. They're still our friends. But this is going to be an issue long term. Project siting and permitting. Um, the guys with the, uh, the game have left, right? But this is kind of like one of those games where the rules keep changing as you play. So it's been an interesting challenge. And I'm not blaming anyone because I know this is new stuff. And it's the Wild West out there in terms of what permitting regulations apply to these kinds of projects. Uh, another real challenge, and this is a technical challenge, is the local grid infrastructure. The wires themselves, the transformers that are, are in place, can they really accept a day like today when the solar project just wants to run full speed? If too many of these go in in a cluster, it can actually stress the grid. 
And so NSTAR and National Grid are studying this as we apply for new projects. And it's becoming a bottleneck in certain areas where it's obvious that you want to install solar. It's just getting crowded. And uh, I think the number one is the long-term government support. Can we really expect the same level of support from our national and state levels that we've enjoyed so far? And you know, this is a problem for someone who's in the business, obviously, but it's also potentially a problem for someone who chooses to invest in it. A lot of these benefits come right when we install the system for you, but some of them are longer term, and people want to know that they're going to be supported in the longer term after having made this investment. Um, Senator Wolf, who I see is lurking around the back, has been very supportive. So please don't, uh, don't let this spill into his uh, reputation. He's been more than supportive. Uh, but if you're looking for places to place, I won't say blame, I'll, I'll say encouragement, um, the Department of Energy Resources has a big responsibility. They are charged with regulating the industry, both on the power producing side and on our side, and playing the cop in this game. And they need to understand the support that technology and infrastructure improvements need so that the Cape and the rest of the state can enjoy this kind of technology. With that, I'll conclude. And uh, Bert, I don't know if we have time for questions. No, any, any questions for, for Judy or for Luke? So from the slide deck, just on the continuing the tax credits, is that what you Government support means continuing the tax credits primarily at the federal and state level? It's a good question. At the federal level, there's a 30% tax credit. That's due to expire in 2016. Seems like a long way off. But um, knowing the certainty beyond 2016 is important for people trying to build a business for more than two or three years. At the state level, there's a rebate for small systems, residential systems. That's always threatened to go away. Every year we wonder if it's going to come back. So letting, in that case, the Mass CEC, the Clean Energy Council, know that that's an important program for residents, which is truly distributed generation. And uh, finally, I'll emphasize a, a very complicated program called the Solar Renewable Energy Certificate Program, or SREC. Anything that's called a REC doesn't sound good to me. <laughs> so this program is currently suffering from the fact that solar has been so successful. We've built too many systems. There are too many certificates on the market, and it's made the price crash. New Jersey crashed two years ahead of us. Now ours is crashing. The DOER, the Department of Energy Resources, has a tool in the form of a formula to make an adjustment to bring the market back. They need to be aggressive about using that tool. This actually hurts the people who have invested in solar and are now trying to cash in those solar renewable energy certificates. So I, those are the primary mechanisms. So the, the question is the global supply of solar panels. Uh, this could be an entire conference, but in a nutshell, um, I'll go out on a limb and say China is dumping. It's driving the rest of the world out of business. Um, the plant in Memphis was owned by Sharp Electronics. Sharp Electronics had issues beyond solar. You know, they're a big company and the rest of their company was having issues. And so the first thing to go is the least profitable division. And that was what they decided to do. Um, the, the other US manufacturers, I mean, the, the newspapers have been fraught with the stories like Solyndra. You know, they were targeting technology toward a price point that changed so fast that they couldn't be in business. And is the long term that prices will stay low and that it'll benefit everyone because of this? I'm not so sure. And that's the real threat. We're giving them a monopoly right now. <laughs> 